you will often encounter problems on Pascal's triangle in your early coding days. And sometimes you would find them in your initial coding rounds as well. Correct? And trust me, it is not just a random arrangement of numbers in a triangle. There are a lot more insights and hidden patterns which you can find from a Pascal's triangle. So in this video, we will not only look at the code and its implementation, but we will devote some time to find out all of these patterns and see what information that we can derive. You will be certainly amazed. So let's find it out. Hello friends, welcome back to my channel. First, we will look at a sample problem and its test case. Going forward, I will tell you step by step how you can make an implementation and then we will go on to the fun part. We will look at some of these hidden patterns and how you can derive them. What all information can you find it out? So without further ado, let's get started. First of all, let's try to take a look at a generic problem that you will find on a Pascal's triangle. So you are given an integer n and you have to generate the first n rows of a Pascal's triangle. So for this particular example, the value of n is 6. Now, what does this mean? It means that this Pascal's triangle will have 6 rows. So how do you go about creating a Pascal's triangle? So this is how you first of all lay out all of your 6 rows. Correct? Now, to begin filling this Pascal's triangle, you always start with the element 1. And then, for all the subsequent rows, the first element and the last element will always be 1. So, for every row, I can fill out the first element and the last element to be 1 itself. Now, as you can see, this first row is complete. The second row is also complete because you only had the first element and the last element. Now, look at the third row. For this third row, you filled out the first element and the last element. But how do you derive what will be the middle element? To find the middle element, just take a sum of the top two elements. So if you have to fill this out, the sum of 1 and 1, that will be 2. So you write down 2 over here. Now your third row is also complete. Moving on to the fourth row, you added 1 at the beginning at the end. You have to fill out this cell, right? And its value will be the sum of two cells above it. So 1 plus 2. What does that give you? 3. For this next cell similarly, you will add up 2 and 1 and you get a 3 again. So this is how you can go about filling each of the row in your Pascal's triangle. Similarly, you can fill down all of these two rows as well. So adding 1 and 3 gives me 4. Then adding 3 and 3 gives a 6. Adding 3 and 1 gives a 4. And similarly, the last row also. So this is how you create a Pascal's triangle. And for the value of n equals to 6, you have created these 6 rows. For this particular test case, this entire list of rows, this will be your answer. So this is how a Pascal's triangle is actually created. Before you begin with the implementation, just take a moment and try to realize how you can approach this problem. For example, I have this Pascal's triangle in front of me, right? Once again, it has six rows. So what you need to do is you need to return me a list of all of these rows. Correct? So you can say that it will be a list of all several different lists as well. This is a list. Then you have the second list, third list, fourth list, fifth list and a sixth list. And all of these lists can be in a form of a list itself. So it will be a list of lists. And you just have to populate all of them. So one thing is very obvious. For every list, the first element and the last element will always be 1. So, except the first row, for every other row, you can just add 1 as your initial element and 1 as the last element. And this is true for every row, correct? So, this takes care of one of the major parts of your Pascal's triangle, right? Now, the remaining part is to fill out all of these elements. And if you notice, how are we filling up each of these elements? For example, to get this element 2, I am adding these above two elements, correct? And similarly, to get this element 4, once again, I am adding the top two elements. Now try to think, to get a particular element, let us say you have to get the second element of your third row, right? What were you adding? You add the first element of your previous row, and the second element of your previous row, right? Once again, to get the third element of your third row, which elements are you adding? 
you are adding the second element of your previous row and the third element of your previous row. So in a way, what we are doing, we are saying that to get the ith element, just add the ith element of previous row and i minus 1th element of previous row. So this is the basic formula that we will use to achieve all of our results. For example, if you have to get this fourth element of your sixth row, what two elements do you add? You add 4 minus 1, that is the third element, and the fourth element of your previous row. This is your previous row. What are the third and fourth elements? This is the third element and this is the fourth element. You add them up and then you get your fourth element of your next row. So this is the basic idea that we will be using to implement our Pascal's triangle. Let us go step by step now and try to implement this thought. So over here, I have a function generate. This function is taking in a parameter number of rows. So that is how I know that, okay, I need to generate five rows of a Pascal's triangle. The next thing that we do is we create a list of list and that is result. And this result is ultimately returned, correct? So this variable will hold all of my lists and it is a list itself. So it will be holding my Pascal's triangle, right? Moving ahead, first of all, I have some base conditions that if you don't have any rows, just simply return this result because it will be empty, right? Moving on, you know that the first row is very special. You just have one element. So I create a first row element that is again a list and then I add just a single integer that is one to it. This is added. So I get my first element of the Pascal's triangle. And once I add this row, just add this row to your final result. So you do result.add and then you put on your first row, correct? So you see how we are about to populate this entire list. Moving ahead, we take care of one other edge case. What happens if the number of rows is only one? If the number of rows is one, simply return the result over here because this is your final Pascal's triangle. You won't have any other elements, right? But right now, the number of rows is five. So you have to repeat a certain process four number of times, correct? So that is where I start a for loop. And this for loop will run four times and it will populate each of the individual rows of the Pascal's triangle. And how do you go about doing it? If you remember, to get all the elements, we need to look back at our previous row, correct? So I create an element priv row where I'm just storing that, okay, this is my previous list. Now, moving ahead, I start a variable row and this will hold my new list. And what do you do over here? First of all, you add a one. So in my new list, what I do? I add a one in the beginning and then I start a loop for i minus one. You know that the second row will not have any elements, correct? So this loop will not run at all. And then what do we do? We once again add a one. So this one gets added once again to my list. So I have completed a row and what I do is I will add this row to my final set. So this is how my triangle is starting to construct, right? Just look at one more iteration and things will become a lot more clearer. So what happens now? This loop runs again. And once again, I capture my previous row. This time previous row is pointing to row number two, correct? You start the next row once again. First of all, you add the element one to it. I added a one, correct? Now you have to populate all of the remaining elements. This time the value of i is two. So this loop will run once. And to get the value, what do you do? You take the previous row and add its two elements. So to fill out this value, you will add these two elements. So this time I add a two over here and that's it. This loop now ends. And once again, I will add a one over here. So one gets added to my list. And once again, this new list is added to my final set. So my triangle becomes a little more larger, right? Once again, this loop will run again. And this time you will have one more list. You once again add a one. This loop will now run two times. So first of all, what you will do is you will add these two elements and I will get a three. For the next iteration, you will add these two elements and once again you get a three over here. This loop will now be over and as a final step you will add one in the end. So this is how your Pascal's triangle will keep on getting constructed and you will add a new row 
to your final set at every iteration. Once this loop is complete, you simply return this result and this time your result will have the complete Pascal's triangle. The time complexity of this solution is order of n square because as you move downwards in the Pascal triangle, your number of elements will keep on increasing and your for loop will run more and more times, right? And the space complexity of this solution is also order of n square because you need all of that extra space to store all of your increasing elements of your Pascal's triangle, right? So this is how the code and implementation of a Pascal's triangle looks like. But what are all the other fun things that you can do with it? Let's find them out. What we will basically do is we will have a Pascal's triangle in front of us and then we will try to find out some patterns. So as you know, a Pascal triangle has a lot of rows. What happens when you add all the elements of each of the rows? For example, in this Pascal's triangle, I have my first row, then I have my second row, then the third and so on. Just try to add all of these elements. So for the first row, if you add, you will get a one. For the second row, one plus one, this will give you a two. The third row, one plus two plus one, this will give you a four. One, three, three and one, add them up and it will give you a eight and so on. And if you notice, what are all of these numbers? All of these numbers are actually powers of two. So one is actually two to the power of zero. Then you have two to the power of one, then two to the power of two, then two to power of three and so on. So basically you are getting powers of two when you add up each of the rows of your Pascal's triangle, right? You just saw how on adding each of the rows, you get powers of two. Similarly, you can derive binomial expansions as well. For example, take a look at this Pascal's triangle. And over here, I have all of my formulas. If you remember, when we expanded these, what did we used to get? So a plus b to the power of zero will simply be one. Then a plus b is simply a plus b. If you remember a plus b whole square, what was that? That was a square plus two ab plus of b square. So what is actually happening over here? This is a one, this is a two, and this is one once again. So what do you find? One, two, and one. And this is synonymous. Similarly, if you try to look at a plus b whole cube, you can see that it will be a cube plus of 3a square b plus of 3ab square plus of b cube. Once again, you can find out the elements of the Pascal's triangle over here. 1, 3, 3 and a 1. And they are the same. So now you know, if you have to find out the next expansion, what will it be? That will be a to the power of 4 plus 4 a to the power of 3 b plus 6 a square b square plus 4 a b cube plus of b to the power of 4. So once again, I am using my elements of the Pascal's triangle to arrive at my complete expansion. Try to do this last part as an exercise on your own. So this is how you can derive binomial expansions also from your Pascal's triangle. The next interesting part is a Fibonacci series. Do you remember how did we add all of the elements in a single row, correct? What happens if you try to look at all of the diagonals in a Pascal's triangle? Let us have a look. So I have this Pascal's triangle in front of me, correct? Now to find out the Fibonacci numbers, what you can do is try to add up elements that you're getting from diagonals. How do you find these diagonals? So start off from here. What element did you get over here? You only got a one in here, right? So you got the first element of Fibonacci series, that is one. Now to obtain the second element, start from over here, you get a one, then you get a one again, and you get the next element that is two. Moving on, you start with this edge, you get a one, then you get a two, so one plus two, and that gives you a three. Move on to the next one, you get a one, three, one. So add them and you get a five. Similarly, if you keep moving ahead, one, four, and three, and that gives you a eight. So you can see that if you keep on iterating through every diagonal, then you will keep on obtaining the next element of your Fibonacci series. Another fun thing that you can do with the Pascal's triangle. But wait, the fun does not end here. If you remember, you had combinations in mathematics, right? Where the value of NCR that used to be n factorial divided by r factorial multiplied by n minus r factorial. 
And if you look at the Pascal's triangle, so I have this triangle in front of me, right? And if you start off with a zero based indexing, so you have your zero row, first row, second, third, fourth, and fifth. Now, every element of the Pascal's triangle represents a combination. For example, look at this element. This is in row two and it is the first element, right? Based upon a zero based indexing. So this value is actually 2C1, where 2 is the row number and C is the element number. So the second row and the first element based upon a zero based indexing. Similarly, if you look at one more element, let's look at this. So this should be fourth row C and then the first element, so 4C1. If you look ahead, you have this element 10. What should this be? This will be 5C3 based upon a zero based indexing. So once again, every element of your Pascal's triangle that can be represented as a combinatorics as well. And once again, this gives you an edge if you're trying to solve problems which involve this particular concept. One last thing that I want to talk about in a Pascal's triangle is perfect squares. So let us say you have this Pascal's triangle in front of you, right? And what if you write it in a different format? So you can see that I have written this Pascal's triangle in a separate format. And once again, this gives you some insights. Just look at this element too. What is the value of two squared? So two squared is actually one plus three. Similarly, three square will be three plus six. And then four square will be six plus 10. So what you can say is that from the second column of your Pascal's triangle, you get all of these perfect squares. And as you keep moving bottom towards more and more rows, you will find this property true for every other row. There are a lot more hidden patterns which you can keep on exploring. But from a programming point of view, what I have seen is these are the most important concepts that will come in handy. So these were just some of the amazing things that you can derive from a Pascal's triangle. As per my final thoughts, I just want to say that whenever you see problems on Pascal's triangle being asked in an interview, then there is a very high chance that you will have some follow up questions as well. And then try to see if you can derive those results from the Pascal's triangle that you have just created. Because in an interview, you are expected that you can think ahead and derive solutions from what has been already offered to you. Trust me, your interviewer will be very happy if you can come up with such solutions. So, have you found out any other applications of a Pascal's triangle as well? Have you found out in interviews? Have you faced any problems while going throughout this entire video? Tell me everything in the comment section below and I would love to discuss all of it with you. As a reminder, if you found this video helpful, please do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This motivates me to make more and more such videos where I can simplify programming for you. Also, let me know what other problems do you want me to solve next. Until then, see ya.